why pathological demand avoidance PDA is not necessarily intrinsic to the person by Richard Woods at London South Bank University PhD student. Um, yeah, I do have some brief conflicts of interest. Um, I'll you can pause it if you would like to know more. Um, a bit about my kind of perspective and bias on the topic. So I am by notice a statistic in 2012. I do meet um, Elizabeth Newsom's PDA profile, but I am not emotionally attached to it. I am no longer basing my identity on diagnostic categories, well, as much as I can do. Um, and I'm equally respecting divergent views and evidence on PDA to critically synthesize, to critically synthesize appropriate interpretations on PDA. My PhD is investigating PDA and it's part of the critical autism, autism slash disability studies group at London and Southbank University. And this is my interpretation of PDA literature and of PDA. Um, others may disagree. Um, I might sometimes use medical model based language in um, this material, but that's purely because it's in the source material. Um, I intrinsically recognise that mental disorders are, uh, as are described in the um, like psychiatric manuals, are social constructs. So, yeah. Um, this should be a shorter talk. It probably be about 20 25 minutes ish. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's a brief introduction, so uh, I'm going to be talking about um, PDA profile of ASD's kind of pervasive dimensional definitions and problems with those definitions. Very briefly talking about transactional stress um, and the importance of um, PDA strategies with transactional demand avoidance. Um, and I'll be talking about examples from PDA literature to um, which kind of support that outlook and then just kind of concluding. So yeah, um, Elizabeth Newson used the, the definitions for pervasive dementia and disorder from the DSM-4, um, but in practice, Phil Christie has been, who, if you believe what some people claim, he's meant to be the leading um, expert on PDA as a um, form of autism. He's been using um, these definitions here for pervasive and developmental. So he would suggest he would say that pervasive suggests that the effects can be seen in all of a child's development, and that developmental means that the disorder is present at birth and gradually becomes um, apparent during the course of development. So there are problematic. There are problems with assuming that these definitions are valid for PDA. Um, and including kind of like contradictory evidence um, and aspects of clinical practice. So talk about issues with the pervasive definition first. So yeah, the DSM-5 actually has a definition for what a disorder is, and it does not require um, disorders to be pervasive. Um, so <laughs> that's the first one. And also the demand of restraints uh, in PDA is primarily about non-compliance to cultural norms and particularly um, non-compliance with Ordinary, ordinary demands from other people. Um, DDAQ is important because most of our empirical research period is done with the extreme demand that questionnaire. And um, the DDAQ itself does not require demand of to be pervasive. Um, so, and that matters because if, if you want to generalize our, um, if you want to generalize research results from the extreme demand of questionnaire, um, means that you can't assume that PDA is pervasive um, and also the definition um, requires PDA to be from early infancy which is not always so in practice so yeah um, this is going to be more important so um, one of the most replicated results in the PDA literature is that as a person um, matures in basic ages the PDA features seem to decrease with age um, so yeah, I've I've kind of written about it briefly um, in one article. So, so basically, Stuart et al. Um, asserted that PDA features substantially decrease with age, and that this is, has ramifications for clinical practice. So, the EAQ has two thresholds, with the lower one um, for those aged twelve and above. Why did it just suggest PDA um, suggest between forty four um, percent and 89 percent of participants do not meet um, clinical threshold for PDA into adulthood? And this is significantly higher than that found for autism. Um, and more recently, a more recent review of autism um, has suggested that um, about 9% of autistic, of, of, of people diagnosed with autism in childhood no longer meet clinical threshold for autism in adulthood. And again, this is substantially higher than what's been seen with PDA. So 
what that means is is that PDA is not a form of autism. Um, but also it matters in terms of pervasive because if the PDA features are not being consistently expressed throughout childhood, it means that they are probably not pervasive. Um, so, yeah. Um, talking about kind of issues with viewing PDA to be developmental in nature, um, the neurological involvement um, is meant to have issues with kind of crawling and kind of um, coordination issues and kind of some epileptic kind of based issues such as seizures. Um, Neeson said that there's not enough evidence to suggest um, to, to show if neurological involvement is part of PDA. Um, and some studies like um, from this in ions, uh, which is based on referring to the DQ initial validation study, suggests that the pervasive value of the history could just seem not to cluster with PDA um, or with other kind of PDA trait um, features. And also kind of more importantly, the common tools for assessing PDA, which are the extreme demand that's questionnaire and the 11 revised PDA DISCO questions. The DISCO is a semi structured interview provided by the National Autistic Society. Um, they do not require PDA to be from early infancy. Um, there's no features in there which assess it to be from early infancy. Or, or the EDAQ has one item, but you're not going to meet threshold. It's not important to meet a threshold, but it's only like one item out of 26. Um, also, the EDAQ has been used to um, diagnose PDA, so, and this is in, in clinical practice. So, yeah, um, so what I'm trying to say is some PDA diagnoses have not required PDA to be expressed from early infancy. Um, kind of there's other issues such as the mental traits are generic, um, as in these uh, the features that are described as PDA and infancy, they are common in, in just all humans basically. Um, it's also been noted that the, the mental features were removed from um, the PDA profile because they were too common in the autistic population, so they were meant to be not useful to help to identify PDA as a as a autism subtype. Um, which is the rationale for removing them. It's also been noted by um, inclusions including Newson and Lorna Wing that um, people can transition into PDA. Um, and also under transactional models of PDA, um, people can be distressed and or traumatised into PDA, basically. There's another issue with the definition for the fundamentals used by Phil Christie is that it's circular in nature. Um, and also, uh, go back to DSM-5, Definition for disorder: It does not require, um, it does not require features to be to be seen from early infancy in order for. So, yeah, um, I'm going to be talking about kind of transactional stress and PDA. So, um, so stress is something that's transactional in the environment that can be both internal to a person and external. And a person becomes stressed when their stressor exceeds um our resources of our coping mechanism. So, the person will find the situation taxing. So the ideal way to reduce some stress levels is to improve the coping mechanisms. Um, so that's just a bit early. So um, yeah. So also research suggests that two thirds of distress behaviours are triggered by demands or questions from other people. So automatically kind of noting that um stress is transactional. Um, and it also our understanding of demand avoidance as written within the DSM five um autism criteria is that. Um, avoidance behaviours and stress is transactional. So this is the quote for the um, criteria C for the DSF autism criteria, and it's basically one which suggests that autism features need to be from early infancy. So symptoms must be present in the early developmental periods and in brackets, but may not become fully manifest until social demands exceed limited um, capacities or may be masked by learned strategies in later life. Um, so it's literally saying that Autism features may not become apparent until basically demands from so, demands from social situations that, uh, out um basically force a person to express their autism features, such as um R or BI's restriction of repetitive behaviors and interest. Um so yeah, um this is a transactional stress developmental model for PDA, which I'm I um suggesting may be appropriate so it has like delayed development social communication function issues kind of depression and trauma in one box uh, anxiety stress down here these are the what i would call the core five um pda um features so um traits so these are like avoidance of water demands come through role playing pretend obsessive behavior uh, which includes the mind avoidance kind of rapid mood changes social avoidance behaviors um in one box and then you have like aversive situations missed developmental opportunities and then you got how 
you know is kind of um as uh, um as experienced as a way of being human um at one end so these all kind of interact with each other so um and they can kind of all interact in different ways um so if you're expressing kind of a lot of the kind of um social avoidance behaviors they will kind of affect the amount of quality and quantity of social interactions that a person will express and that will kind of lead into that because if you're having like small amounts of very of, of poor quality social situations that will kind of feed into that will likely feed into um like obviously delayed social development etc etc which may go into there or into anxiety which can kind of feed into people kind of having limited social situations and stuff so yeah i mean i would suggest that this developmental stress um sorry this transactional stress developmental model for pda seems to have um face validity um so moving on to pda strategies and these are important so these are um ones that are taken from autism educational trust um two case studies that they republished um and they were, i hoovered them all up into a review article i did it, um three years ago so yeah, a uh, specific key work and trusted relationship, being flexible and adaptable, having indirect praise, letting things go, negotiating by providing choices to people, so that tends to be two to three choices, um, having positive relationships with them, thinking aloud, um, thinking a tone of voice and what information that might be conveying, um, treating anger as communication, like using humour, using role play novelty and various materials and use of visual communication methods. That's like having um, multiple ways to communicate with people and um, allow people to, to um, absorb information in a way which is kind of suitable for them. Um, so, yeah, um, this matters because if you consider the nature of the PDA strategies, they seem to replicate generic good practice. Um, so, for example, the um, educational psychologist version of um, sorry, division of the British Psychological Society responded to um, the British government's um, call to have like more authority and stricter kind of um, behaviour management policies in UK schools. And basically, the, the BPS's response was was highly critical. So um, they said that simplistic and reactive approaches are stressful to teachers and do not adequately teach children why the behaviour should change. They kind of also this particular quote is important. So, warm, supportive relationships with adults, a sense of belonging, high expectations, teacher to social emotional skills, and autonomy are key ingredients to positive behaviour change for children and young people, <laughs> which sounds like a lot of the features that are being described as PDA strategies. More importantly, a recent review article um, by Stephen Cap has this quote. So, for example, bidirectional effects exist between autistic people's externalised behaviours and parental distress or criticism, but they appear more driven by parents' impacts on their children. So what that means is it look is likely that caregivers' interactions with the children will how they interact with the children will likely cause them to express the kind of PDA fe um, features. So yeah, um, and there is some kind of okay. More another quote from the same Park was also quite important, and and so a substantial proportion of the risk of poor outcomes is likely to be socially produced, and the course of an autistic individual's development is determined by other factors as much as the condition itself, including the enrichment and modification of the social environment. Social context also affects autistic people's functioning, such as benefits from parental acceptance waters and inclusive education settings. Um, this is quite important because there seems to be some research indicating that this similar kind of thing is happening with PDA in terms of um, accepting um, people's kind of behaviours um, and kind of using kind of um, the PDA strategies. Um, that if you effectively use PDA strategies, that they will kind of result in a decrease in kind of PDA behaviours, and also that if a caregiver is clashing a lot with their children or person, that they will kind of cause um well often that often that you will see a higher rate of pda feeds to be presented so i'm going to read the quote out so this is from um lauren good's 2016 um doctoral thesis so yeah um across both groups parental well-being and child parent closeness were found to reduce the parent child conflict was found to increase a parent a parent report um was found to increase of uh, as parent reported severity of PDA increase indicated that severity of PDA may have clinical implications for parental and relational outcomes, highlighting the importance of considering systematic factors in, in 
clinical work with this population. Additionally, findings show that um, parent reports of PDA severity decreased as the length of time followed donated PDA increased. One hypothesis is to explain that the latter finding is that parents learn to develop strategies to deal with their child's PDA symptoms over time, indicating that coping may change over time. Once a child receives a diagnosis of PDA, parents may become more skilled at dealing with um, or reducing associated behaviours and symptoms, which in turn reduces the frequency of severity of PDA symptoms. In support of this hypothesis, treatment control was only um, was only illness perception domain found to increase with duration of diagnosis, indicating that parents' belief that PDA can be managed controlled um, increases over time. Um, yeah, as I said, um, I would interpret that as being that caregivers are more effective using PDA strategies and therefore placing less demands or less subversive demands on on the children and therefore the children are expressing less PDA features. Um, I'd also point out there's probably also other factors going on such as um, the children or person learning to, to use um, alternative coping mechanisms to the PDA strategies. Um, so yeah this is another quote from um, a study which uh, was investigating potential aspects of of, um, of PDA. So so that's the autism spectrum screening questionnaire and um, go go items um item which is specific one avoid demands of score significantly higher in girls and boys with autism and ADHD. This item relates to the concept of pathological demand avoidance PDM brackets developed in the 1980s by Lisa now often considered a subgroup of autism. Um, the avoidance is in PDA is connected with social anxiety and excessive demand resistance, and in contrast to classic kind of ADHD cases, to better pretend play so on the um autism spectrum screening questionnaire girl the girl and boys with nhc showed similar high discrepancy rates of demand points in as in the, the autism groups some different interpretations are plausible of, of the reported gender differences regarding demand points it could be that parents may be may have a less demanding attitude to boys and girls leading to girls to force avoidance so i.e. it might be that the caregivers are placing more demands on girls, therefore they are expressing more PDA features. Um, an alternative hypothesis is girls are diagnosed with um, autism and or ADHD might also meet clinical uh, criteria for diagnosis of PDA. Um, that's me just pretty pointing out that Gilberg is saying that, well, Kopp and Gilberg um, are literally writing that PDA might be seen in um, non-autistic ADHD um, girls, basically. Um, so, yeah, um, there's also um, examples of other adults placing demands on um, children being attributed with PDA and therefore they are expressing PDA features. So um, this is a quote from the Zenon's thesis. So her study eight is basically um, designing and validating, well, they're trying to initially validate um some adults items to screen for PDA. So the adults is the autism um autism diagnostic observation schedule. Um there's two versions of it. Um but basically it's not designed to assess what PDA features because why would it? Like if PDA is an autism, so why would why why would the adults screen for autism? Um sorry, sorry, why would the adults screen for PDA? Um so a neon's basically developed um about 30 odd items to screen for PDA. Um and of the, of the kind of clinical overlap. So she, she and someone else conducted about 90, or attempted to conduct about 90 adult assessments, and about a fifth of the cases, fifth, fifth of those adult assessments could not be completed. Um, so this is what she's talking about here. So of those case participants for whom testing could not be completed, six displayed avoidance to the extent that testing could not take place. Well, these three had extreme reactions, tantrums, outbursts, or physical violence. Which also occurred in three participants who did who did complete testing. Three, just three participants could not be tested due to extreme avoidance plus learning difficulties. Um, this text deleted is or just admitted is talking about kind of learning difficulties or which contributed to the adult assessment not being completed. Um, so it's continued. And two asked to leave the session early um, on the protocol. So yeah, um, the adult um, tests are basically replicating uh, a controlled social interaction so over an extended time period often about 30 to 40 minutes from understanding um off the top of my head um um so they're placing um demands on the person over an extended time period um essentially from what from from how i'm interpreting it um so yeah um 
so this is a quote from a recent article that's published in the PDN Education um, PDA Special Issue. And it's talking about kind of transactional stress, um, understand well, high models for PDA. So, yeah, when encouraged to interact with their environment in a way that causes or exacerbates um, the stress, e.g., force to have a blood test with no agency, a child relies on often extreme avoidant behaviours to circumvent unpleasant stimuli. The extremity of these behaviours is determined by the severity of aversion caused by perceived cost and probability of an outcome. As a child grows, they garner a greater sense of agency, allow them a greater degree of control over their life, which likely reduces their reliance on extreme demand of one's behaviours. For example, a participant in their presence um, in a present study describes postponing an appointment upon discovering she, um, she needed a blood test. So in brackets, um, when I found out I needed a blood test, I managed to postpone it for a month. As an adult, the participant was able to exercise the agency by postponing the appointment, something a child would likely have to resort to extreme behaviours in order to achieve. Um... Yeah, I'm also mentioning this because um, as a, any individual kind of matures or grows in kind of Western neoliberal culture, the more it's culturally expected and acceptable to kind of give them more choice, to give them more options, to expect them to kind of assert their own self-agency and to assert their own autonomy. Um, so what that means is that like less kind of um, aversive demands like to be placed on the person as they grow older, as they mature. So... Um, it might also help to explain why um, PDA features seem to decrease with age. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be wrapping up and concluding on including. So, if, all, if someone is expressing avoidance behaviours, they are often a result of environmental demands. So, demands that are placed upon them. So, this is literally kind of like, this is kind of like the old expression, um, like they're saying, like, if there's, there's no smoke without fire kind of thing. Um, autistic development is affected by other factors as much as by autism itself. So that poor outcomes, such as, for example, pervasive demand avoidance, are likely to be at least partly socially produced. Um, it's also important to consider the nature of the PDA strategies replicating good practice, that if they were widely practiced at university with autistic people, they will likely have a, a positive outcome, they will likely to have a positive effect on autistic person's development. So, so using nice and PNH strategies will likely be important to the development of most, if not all, autistic persons, and that would likely be in a positive way. Um, because of that, it's ethically problematic claiming PNH strategies are specific to a minority of autistic persons, um, because it could denying what seems to be good practice strategies to most autistic persons is likely to have an adverse effect on many autistic persons' development and therefore lead to poor outcomes, which makes it ethically problematic to to claim that PLA strategies are specific to minority of autistic persons. I'd also point out that as autism development is affected by other factors as much as by autism itself, um, it makes it problematic viewing PDA to features to be intrinsic to the person and therefore claiming it to be a profile of autism. So one can claim PDA to be, to be an intrinsic individual, but you cannot claim that PDA is a profile of autism because um, they basically contradict each other. Um, so why are PDA profile autism advocates claiming PDA is intrinsic to the person? Um, I'm just going to quote um, Jonathan Greenatel, 2018A, which is, Nixon and colleagues cited parents to her, um, her remarks on this recognition factor to support the validity of a separate pathological demand of concepts. concept. Autism never made sense to us. This is the first time a diagnosis made sense. Such pattern recognition might, however, be subjected to a range of expectation and confirmation biases. So, yeah, I'm just going to end it on that. Um, and these are my contacts and um, contact information and resources and information. So there's my email, my Twitter handle, my research page link has most of my kind of um, conference talks and publications on. Um, and this links to my YouTube channel, which you should be watching this video on. Um, so yeah, there's only like four reference lines. Um, I'm not going to be lingering them too long because you can just pause the video um, and access them. So yeah, um, this is second reference slide. Um, and this is the third one. Um, so yeah, and we're moving on to the last one, and that's it. So I hope you have found the video interesting and helpful, um, and I hope you see the next one.